if you take your food personally like me, then you need to get on the Thrive Food Discovery and Ordering app. Join the community of foodies on the Thrive feed where you can curate restaurant lists, ask for recos and chat about all things food. So download it today and start thriving. Welcome to today's episode of Speak Greasy. My guests are Diggy and Soam, the dynamic duo behind the food and travel experience startup, The Soul Company. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank and you. welcome back to Max Street Kitchen for what, the 100th time? <laughs> 200th time. I just In the last one week. I want you to know you're one of the first guests I've had who has not cooked here. But anyway, you are always welcome. Thank you so much. So it's a reminder you to cook. Yeah. <laughs> Soul Company is described as a platform for food, art, culture, experiences and discovery, right? Tell us what that actually means. Um, so when we started in 2020, the idea was how do we uh, create uh, experiences for people coming into the country? How did they see India through uh, our lens, which was through the eyes of uh, uh, chefs, food commentators, uh, artists, art gallery owners. Uh, and the idea was to create like day long experiences with these people. Um, we were talking to travel companies across the world, figuring out ways of uh, being a part of their travel itinerary. And uh, then obviously 2020 was a great year to start a travel company because uh, the pandemic hit and then everything dramatically changed. Um, after that, a huge part of our focus because of the folks who were part of the platform, whether it was chefs or, you know, food writers, uh, bartenders, was to create intimate experiences with them, whether it was at-home experiences uh, through delivery menus in 2020 and 2021. And after that, when things started opening out, uh, that's when we started uh, creating uh, intimate tables at chefs' homes. Uh, then we started stepping out to standalone venues, started working with Max Street Kitchen, hotels, uh, and today work with uh, chefs and bartenders from across India and the world uh, in creating dining and cocktail experiences uh, for consumers in India. But what led you to even start it in the first place? Because your background is in brand marketing. Uh, so what led to this? Um, I think pretty much the reason why we do events today, which was to get people to come and eat and drink. And that's what I loved doing. Uh, and more than eating, it was to actually meet chefs and meet bartenders as to um, I think the word harass might be a little much, but uh, <laughs> trouble a lot of uh, restaurants to introduce me to their chefs because I still love doing that, meeting them. I feel like the perspective is so different when you when you have that one-on-one uh, -on -one experience. Diggy, you sort of head the brand aspect of it and how would you um, differentiate the sole company from other sort of experience-led you know, companies out there? Um, I do not know how we might be different, but how we do it um, would be, first, we actually only look at chefs, bartenders, culinarians, or anyone in this sphere whom we really love. So they are all friends of ours. So we, we don't have a, a vendor and a event company experience or, or, or an equation like that. We actually do have more friend, uh, friend equation where uh, these people are people we know from our previous experiences, people we have met um, through people like you or someone else. And, and we have really had a, had a deep relationship with them. And when they come and do pop-ups across, the consumers can really see our friendship and our, our bond together. And this gives us the liberty to actually tell them what works for India, uh, what doesn't work in India, what are the things that the consumers find interesting. So it's not an Excel sheet or a form which they fill, but... Uh, it's way more intimate. That's intimate experience for us, where we are there with them. I mean, I think that's absolutely fair to say. I've seen that firsthand. But, you know, you started off um, wanting to cater to individual travelers or smaller groups of travelers. And now it's sort of become into sort of, you know, larger format events, not necessarily large format. Is that focus on the individual traveler who wants something curated for them still something that you do or do you see scope for that? I think pre-pandemic, uh, intimacy was a kind of lesser used currency that either travel companies or experience companies kind of knew about or would speak about. I think the pandemic taught us the value of intimacy in that sense. A lot of experiences that were unfolding online at that point in time, whether it was culinary experiences that were happening at that point in time, chefs cooking in their kitchen and you cooking along with them. So I think intimacy became a, a far more accessible thing. Um, we were focused on that before the pandemic. I think post the pandemic, what we've learned is 
that how do we bring intimacy into the dining space? So while restaurants exist and while, uh, you know, uh, bars exist out there, I think people like the idea of being able to dine in a communal space, like in a magazine street kitchen, or like to be able to do something in a pop-up format where, they're, where they have access to the chef. Uh, and even though they can travel to these destinations, to be able to have them in your city is a very different experience. So today, while we have some private clients who we plan some of these travel experiences for, um, the nature of it in India has changed to be more focused on uh, dining and bar experiences, which are for small groups, no doubt. But uh, the travel experiences are more international now. So it's also like the social aspect that's equally important as the experience itself, the, the food and beverage experience. Right. So if we have, for example, 3000 people in our database, we do also have this 200 or 100 people, uh, for lack of any other term, we used to call them marquee. Uh, these marquee members are the ones who can ask us for anything, anytime, anywhere. So, for example, if a chef is coming to Mac Street and if a marquee guest asks us, could we spend some time with them? We would absolutely do that. If they want to stage with them also, they can uh, at the, the pop-up. It's, it's basically what you want from this experience, apart from the food and beverage that's being offered to you. It's something that we cater to them. In fact, all the experiences that we offer are given to them first and they have the liberty to accept it, deny it or do more about it. So, yeah. How do you identify these people? I mean, some of the chefs you brought, like from Singapore, from Thailand, uh, you know, all over, even like Bangladesh. I mean, I know some of the chefs that you brought here, I would not have come across. How do you go about meeting these people? Uh, yeah, uh, That's a trade secret. You have to speak to our <laughs> lawyers about it. You know, but like, I think the Gant can answer that. I have a very witty answer. Uh, go for the it. The answer was by spending a lot of money, by eating around the world. No, but uh, the so that's probably true to a large true, extent. Yeah. Part of it, yeah. That's a part of it. So even before I joined Seoul, I always had this interest to eat around. Uh, probably that's why I don't uh, have any bank balance left because I really love to eat and travel and explore and not from the perspective of having a baggage and saying that, hey, listen, I am the head of brand at Seoul Company, um, but hey, I am Digant and I really appreciate what you do. Can I explore it more? And then I would promote it or move to the next phase. So whenever Soma and I travel across, uh, in India for sure, and now abroad uh, in Singapore and Malaysia and all, we first actually ask the chefs, uh, be it a chef in a Michelin star restaurant, in Asia 50 best, world 50 best, where do they go to eat? And we take them out of that uh, restaurant. For example, uh, there's a chef, Tristine Farmer from Zen. Um, we met him, I mean, we all ate together. And then the next day I asked him, hey, listen, the next time I'm in Singapore, I'm going to take you out of your restaurant and sit with you. And I did that. And then he recommended a couple of places. And from there, we got to know so many other people. Um, even for Vikram Jeet and Michael, we took them to King Inki. And that's how King Inki came down. And um, the entire uh, uh, community came together for us. It's actually going around, understanding from people where they eat, not going through any of the guided lists. Mostly not, uh, but a mix of um, just asking people what they want. Or places like Bangladesh, where we literally go by our gut feeling, go into the market, and whatever we feel great, we ask them, would you like... Like, we had the insane stuff of asking Haji Biryani, would you like to come down to India? And they were like, uh, what? But yeah, interesting. Do you, you might have, yeah. Yeah, and I think we've learned a lot from our consumers and diners over the last few years, right? Uh, while we like a lot of chefs and we feel that this is food that will be accepted, I think we've gotten that confidence also from some of the pop-ups we started right in the beginning and it's not just the kind of food but it's also the format sometimes right like the number of courses or if you're doing like a family style dining uh, experience will people accept that so therefore that kind of broadens our horizons also of who we can bring I think kind of dispelling some of those myths of you know it's only a certain kind of chef or it's like only awarded chef so it's only you know it's a chef from a certain list uh, is all that will work in India I think that is also something post-pandemic world has taught us uh, that uh, a lot of this works and even from the consumers that we have seen at the Magazine Street Kitchen come in and accepted such a variety of uh, chefs. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think we eat like how we want people to eat and we travel like how we would like people to travel and that's where a lot of these inputs. For bars, we uh, just recommend the ones where we got really drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't remember it. Yeah, if you don't remember, it's uh, it's definitely coming down, yeah. No, but I, I, I mean, I have to say like some of the um, cuisines or chefs that you've introduced here. I mean, we started the Soul Kitchen, which was all about, you know, digging a little deeper into India and going beyond North Indian and South Indian. And 
uh, and I know it opened up my eyes, like when we had Chef Al, um, you know, doing the Naga and, you know, even from Pondicherry, uh, Shea Pushpa. It, it opened up my eyes to foods that I'd never had before. And, uh, and I know that's what works for a lot of, um, you know, the common audience that we share. Coming back to the idea of pop-ups and, you know, this movement of chefs, brands going between cities, countries. How do you kind of explain the importance of this to a brand? Because I know there's a lot of financial considerations when doing this, not just in terms of bringing chefs across, but also when they're leaving their restaurant, sometimes they have to like shut shop. Why should chefs be or bars be doing this? You know, over the past five years, uh, with all the restaurants and bars, like you were saying, coming in the list, India is has got a spotlight on. Now, it's it, people are living vicariously and seeing what India is doing. They just don't have the confidence to come down over here because nobody has approached them. So when we go to them and we when we speak about India, the first uh, reaction for them would be, oh, I've heard of India, I've heard of these restaurants, I have heard of these people, but I do not know if it if it works out for me. Then we have to break it down for them it's not only the pop-up, but you get to meet these people. You get to spend some time uh, in, for example, in Bangalore, in Bombay, in Delhi, understand the country, the culture, the cuisine. And this is a great re- deliverable for them because they really want to know what is happening in India, the subcontinent, of course. Um, but we are fulfilling that one part of their entire checklist, which is not only the pop-up, but um, am I absorbing a lot more of, am I just sitting in the hotel room for the past next three days? Or am I going out and... So the experiences that we create for everyone, for the consumers, we are giving it back to them. So it's like a cycle. Yeah. And you know, the point of leaving the kitchen and coming, I think one thing from day one we did, starting with chefs in India, we were very clear that everyone's time has to be paid for. Uh, I think there was a culture of, uh, you know, the way pop-ups were happening before that, maybe largely in hotels at that point in time, not too many standalones who were doing it. I mean, uh, you guys were pioneers in what you were doing back then, but there wasn't a lot of that proliferating elsewhere. But I think that was something that we were very particular about from day one, because while we felt it was important for our time also to be compensated for, and that happens through various models, but most importantly for the chefs, and especially when they're coming from outside, because like you said, they're leaving the kitchens. Those kitchens are much tighter spaces. They're smaller teams. A lot depends on the name of the chef and the chef being there. So I think to kind of break through some of that, uh, one was obviously saying that, listen, this is not a market, you know, you know, free lunches. So you need to, you will be compensated. You will have a great diner on the other side. You will have great experiences out here. Um, And most importantly, uh, I think now India is also being seen as a market where for a lot of these brands and these chefs and bars, uh, it's also moving the PR needle for them back home. Uh, I think what is it doing for them in terms of being recognized within their markets Uh, A market like Singapore is, at the end of the day, a small market from a consumer perspective. It's a large market from a conversation perspective. So to be seen traveling across the continent, and especially markets like India, uh, moves that needle for them too. So I think all of those are getting ticked today. So in these last sort of three years or so, how have you seen the India F&B story kind of develop during and post-pandemic? That's like a two-hour-long monologue that I can give. Go for it. We'll just edit no, no, I... all of it out. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you? Uh, I think you can go back to the whole idea of intimacy, right? I think the idea that there are now uh, smaller concepts in terms of space and size, more f- laser focused on, uh, you know, specific um, products that the chef feels that they can put out on a day-to-day basis without having to expand their menu beyond the point just to kind of pander to a lot more people. Um, I think that's one thing the pandemic taught uh, a a lot of operators and chefs at the same time. So you have a lot of restauranters now investing in concepts or investors investing in uh, chefs out there. The other thing is, I feel uh, while we are in the business of doing pop-ups, I think there's there's a good and bad side to it. I feel the good side is that consumers are getting to experience a lot across the country and across the world at their doorstep. the other good is that chefs are now a lot more happier to step out, collaborate with others, see how other markets are. Uh, the other not so good side maybe is maybe there's also too much of it happening, uh, you know, in at, at a certain level, which is confusing consumers also to an extent. Uh, but I think overall the end product of it is good for everyone because uh, people are getting to test concepts before they might open a restaurant around it. 
uh, they're able to test it with a real audience, a paying audience. And the audience is paying a significant premium on what they might on a normal dining night through a pop-up. Um, and I feel, finally, this there seems to be a genuine recognition and acceptance of what we're doing in India, outside India now. We see it when we go out. Um, we see chefs and restaurants out there who are very curious about what chefs and restaurants out here are doing. And not just like in the fine dining space, but also what's happening locally. I, I can't tell you how many times you've had chefs and bartenders come from outside India and like, we want to eat local. We want to go and see what's happening in the smaller places, what's happening in the dive bars of India. So they really want to understand what the dining culture out here is. So, um, yeah, I think that's overall been good because now we have that that variety in concepts. You can go to a 30-seater bar and have a great experience and you can also go to a 300-seater microbrewery and have a great experience. I do feel actually uh, the brands, as in the, the ones who are hosting, have become very adventurous now. Uh, if it's a five-star hotel or a restaurant in the list, they are just shedding off their, uh, you know, the fine dining aspect of it and they can go, if I may to use the term, batshit crazy with ideas. Um, if, if like the, the concept of residency, four hands, these were not as big in India as it used as it is in the in the Western world. Uh, even in like Singapore and Hong Kong, it's also a new 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 existence. But we are replicating things that are happening at a Mandala Club in Singapore, or uh, four hands that are happening so beautifully. Uh, I think all of that is coming to India, and by virtue of that coming to India, I think the the consumers are understanding the value of the chefs. So it's not only restaurants, but people are actually deep delving into bartenders, chefs. Um, I think the the gap between our bartender and our consumer is decreasing slowly and slowly that a, a, a consumer will actually WhatsApp a bartender and ask, hey, listen, I used a martini bianco instead of a, another or a different vermouth. Do you think I'm doing my Negroni right? In that process, we have changed. Now a consumer is making a Negroni at home and asking the bartender, hey, listen, I, I drank it at your bar. Do you think I'm making the same thing once again? I actually think that um, and I think that you guys are a big part of being responsible for this. I think that post-pandemic, I've seen the rise of the anti-restaurant in a way. And I don't mean that in a negative way. But just that this idea of pop-ups, of, uh, you know, with residencies, um, even supper clubs. It's all this parallel sort of um, dining experience that's happening to restaurants. And I think they're coexisting pretty well just wanting to try so many different things without necessarily having to leave your city is what's now available to people. So uh, we've talked very um, seriously about all aspects now. I'm going to get a little more controversial. What's your take on awards and uh, the impact it's having on our industry? Do. I actually, it's very interesting because I was a hotelier before and I have seen this industry and I do feel it makes great restaurants and great chefs greater. There's a reason to it. Um, I do feel by the virtue of being there on the list, they're actually helping a lot more other restaurants being aspirational, um, countries being aspirational. Um, I do feel World 50 Best, when in the World 50 Best you see a restaurant from Colombia or in Asia 50 you see a restaurant from Indonesia. I really want to go to Indonesia now. If I want to go to Indonesia, there are other 50 people who want to go to Indonesia who have no clue about what the uh, the list is and the f &B industry. I do feel it's a great... Um, uh, Michelin is, of course, different from the Asia and the World 50 Best. Uh, I'm not a spokesperson for either of them. But as a consumer and as somebody who have been there and seen it, I do feel it, it instigates that feeling of, hey, I want to be here. And by virtue of I want to go this place, I want to also explore all the other... Um, I shouldn't say parallel restaurants that are there. If I would have not known about Zen, I would have not met Tristan. If I would have not met Tristan, I would have not known of the other five restaurants that he recommended. Or Suring for that matter when we went to uh, when we went to Thailand. Um, I feel it's a great starting point for consumers to actually get into understanding what is great. I mean, everything is good food, but what is great food? There is something said, to be said about the integrity of how things are built and the consistency of how it kind of plays out. Um, I know there's been a lot of like questions every time a list comes out anywhere, whether it's the 50 best or if it's something in India by a, a media house out here on, you know, this is missing or that's missing. But I mean, you think about like the Nobel, only one person gets it, right? Obviously, so many people missed out. So 
I feel that we what we tend to forget sometimes and now I mean we all are part of the industry in that sense is that this is our daily lives right we are constantly looking at restaurants in our space looking at restaurants outside um or bars uh, from that perspective who's doing something interesting or oh, why why isn't this one getting showcased or why is this one getting too much of limelight and i think what we tend to forget is all of this is being created for the consumer right and we are also consumers at the end of the day uh, and if this pushes the consumer in a certain direction like viganta said if it is if it pushes them to go and travel to a country uh, and that becomes your starting point right you start off with a 50 best list and say okay these two three restaurants or bars i can go to um depending on how much you can spend and everything and then from there what do i do i think defines a lot about that diner specifically uh i think what is important on the flip side of all of this is that lists and guides to not just be seen as an as a media opportunity i mean all this recognition helps in driving traffic only at the end of the day but um uh, I think we're seeing an increasing trend where everyone's very driven by it. It becomes pretty much the motivation to set up a space, and uh, it's good to have those ambitions, but uh, that cannot be your need ambition. Um, and and I feel largely if if that is all that drives you, then it it kind of at some level affects the industry at large because if every investor out there, if every chef, if every bartender gets into the industry to get onto the list. at the end of the day a list has 50 spots and then the extended list uh the michelin guide when it comes to india or at least wherever it is in other countries has only those many pages so uh there are only those many names who can come so let's build an industry that allows for innovation allows for creativity allows for uh businesses that flourish uh and then also be on list i did ask a chef by the way uh in singapore um who is on the list and also in the michelin that how do you feel um because the next year it can be anything um and and he gave a very beautiful reply he said when we get on the list or whenever we get the number or we get the stars that day we are very happy we tell each other that you know this is the best thing we could have done and the next day it's back to normal at any point if the restaurant goes down in a list or goes down in the michelin it doesn't prove that it's 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 bad restaurant it just shows that there is room for more people to come and shine um and and be in the front and like som said i do feel that you know how when you make a great movie and then you get an oscar but you don't make the movie because you want oscar like if you're obsessed with it you might not get it it is a necessary ingredient in the in the entire recipe but it shouldn't be the only star dish uh. sure i think that's a nice way of putting it and you're right that um it also depends on whose perspective you're looking at it from and there just needs to be balance and i always say this when you know i i i know every time something comes out there's always little bruha about it but uh, it's it, it regardless of who was on it there's always going to be that and uh, i think you have to also trust the consumer a little bit to use their sort of common sense and uh, you know use this as one filter not the only filter to decide where they're going to have i'm going to drift a little bit and i know i'm going to take some time out of this but i do feel in india we feel it way more because we have always been fed with this idea of ranking in your life in school in colleges we give so many exams entrance exam you have to so the ranking system in our head is is in an obsessive point than other countries in asia i feel they are great with the ranks they are good with but for us it's that constant thing that hey listen i need to be the first i need to be there's no room for second and i think that creates that environment of not animosity but just that friction which is not needed i think there's there's definitely a competitive uh, sort of streak to this uh, you know this aspect and it's it's actually a lot of it's out of your control so uh you know you have to take it with that grain of salt and i think we just have a list where like you just put out your revenue numbers <laughs> <laughs> and say that this is the best restaurant in india you talked about meals which range from 5000 to 15000 i would go with 2 and a half to 65 70000 what's your take on this like how do you value a meal how do you price a meal you need to justify it at a layer of kind of marketing the meal and then on the night when the experience plays out right i feel that obviously the ones that are in the 30 40 50 000 range raise the most amount of questions but i think what we keep asking ourselves also at soul company is that when people walked out were they talking about the experience in the food or were they talking about how much they paid because that can even happen at a 3000 rupee experience everyone kind of loves to uh 
talk about the you know the the five digit ones and i think what tends to happen in the process is that uh, again that seems to be a large conversation amongst industry folks right and i love to then quickly be able to dial someone who actually was at that pop up who actually paid money for the pop up yes there is also a culture of a lot of people getting invited or you know like maybe corporates buy it out and therefore you know they give it out to their top customers and all of that right but there there are people at every pop up who have paid money to be there what did they feel about it did they like the food did they like the experience sometimes the food is great but the experience is so blah right like nothing happened the food just kept coming to the table and going so as long as you can justify those two uh, levels i feel why not how do you value or how do you put a price to the intangibles so to speak of an experience because to me as a restaurant or yes i'm in a business i want to make money but i also want my consumers enjoy a meal and even if there are screw ups which happen which sometimes they do like you know sometimes a dish doesn't come out the way it's supposed to and you never know this right in a, ahead of time they're not they're not sort of hung up on how much they've spent they recognize that it's more than what they would spend if they were going to that restaurant maybe in that city because yes there's a cost of bringing people across etc but beyond the point it's not prohibitive and the intent for everyone involved whether it's your as sort of curators whether it's the chefs cooking whether it's um us as a venue are all aligned in that they want the consumer to have a great experience and a um and and value right value is so important so how do you kind of um figure out the price of those intangibles when that tends to be the goal so much sense with an excel sheet <laughs> yeah yeah sadly and very boring you always go back to the consumer at some level right? because the thinking from a math perspective does begin from there if you look at a consumer who's waking up in the morning thinking about a three michelin star restaurant that is also on the 50 best list for instance and says that listen my life is too busy for me to wake up whenever i want to uh, and i don't have i'm not jobless like diggy and so on to like get up and go to singapore and eat at these places i do place a lot of value now i'm talking about the consumers intangibles now then i'll get to ours right uh that is one huge intangible that they also can't put a price on but we try to put a price on that right saying that we're bringing this experience to you we are also tuning the experience to some extent for what works here we don't want to have a chef come and exactly adapt what they do back home we also want them to work with produce that works well in india so therefore create dishes that work well here uh obviously it's your style it's your signature and everything um so that's one large part of an intangible that we place on that the second is that venues that we work with need to correspond with that price point also right i think it's very important and i'm not just saying that hotels automatically are a place where you can charge a lot it's not it's not just about how the place looks but it's also about how the uh, experience flows so for instance there are chefs that we may choose or not choose to bring to magazine street kitchen because does the kitchen and does the entire experience support that kind of a meal that they want to do or do we change things out here to be able to support that and we've done that in the past here similarly with hotels uh if it is like a lot of like european chefs we worked with or that style of food need a french brigade system of a kitchen uh need a certain nearly one person to three diners kind of a service system then when we work with a hotel even there there are very specific hotels we'll choose to work with because then we know that they can execute that that ensures that we are not sitting at the end of the meal saying oh that one little mess up means that now we are questioning the price or the consumers questioning the price because we know that all of those things were in place it was rehearsed practiced so many times before the chef even landed there i think to be able to translate that experience which you would get at that restaurant here but take it up a notch in terms of maybe the wine selections that are there the spirit brands that come on board what bottles are they opening up on that night uh to how the service plays out to how have we kind of localized the experience without losing the chef's signature those are the intangibles for a customer that we believe or then the price doesn't become so much of a question um and from our perspective i think it's very clear right we we do operate out of a excel sheet and that's the boring part that we don't put up on instagram which is why everyone thinks we're only eating and having fun right but i think that is a key part because we have multiple partners working with us there is a venue partner there is a um, maybe a spirit brand or a lifestyle brand that has come on we're also aligning their objectives onto this right so it's not just that they are providing spirits that day or they're parking a car in the porch that day it's also how do you bring in 
a consumer who would enjoy that meal and also understand our product. At the end of the day, to be very honest, when we sit with a drink at the end of the night, we are like, how many people walked out questioning that price? And therefore, how often do we do something like this and what do we change becomes a question. I think it's credit to us to some extent that we've not had to have too many of those painful conversations and drinks till now. I think the other part, while we're talking about all the expensive ones, um, and this is very true for us at the Soul Kitchen, when we got some of the emer emerging chefs uh, from various parts of India, the price that we charged, a lot of people could have asked, hey, like for a chef like this, I would not be paying. And we we, we had like 5,000, 5,500. Um, I think it's also the effort and the, the, the I, I, I would call it the vulnerable, vulnerability of the cuisine um, in the sense that, for example, I would take an example, the Hakka Chinese one that we did and was priced at 5,000 rupees is because you don't get it anymore. If you go to Edward's house, you will get the exact experience. If you come out of Ed Edward's house, you can go to many Hakka Chinese restaurants. You have been to Kolkata recently. They're all a form of Indian Chinese. But it's the, the novelty of that cuisine. And we are setting the benchmark, saying, hey, listen, for an experience like this, or even Shea Pushpa, when you go to her house, I think it's around, what, 1,500 rupees? And we charge around 4,000 rupees. It's also because she's 80 years old and she came and cooked for us. I think those are those intangible values that we add, which are very, like you said, is very difficult to really explain. You know, um, in my short career working with chefs, I've come across my fair share of personalities and characters. Um, so tell us uh, about in your uh, even shorter career of working with chefs, some of the fun moments that you had. We had a chef who asked, uh, oh, we didn't know that there'll be Wi-Fi or internet in India. So, wow. But, but that was a very innocent one because they didn't realize that we have, like, he didn't, he or she didn't realize that. It's like that. that whole, we walk around on, like, I mean, we move around on elephants and... <laughs> we had a, another one where they were like, in hotels in India, when you have a wake-up call, people come and wake you up. Which we, by the way, realized is it's possible. possible. At like it's all okay, the hotels no. in India, like at a, at five-star hotels, that's the ultimate emergency protocol that they actually send in someone to your room to wake you up if it's for a flight but they assume that that's the only wake up call you get in India that somebody will come and <laughs> wake you up so okay, yeah. you, you guys are being politically correct no we're not no no I, no, no, I was just going to say they might be right or it might not those be are right. not the challenges that you have to deal with okay so give us some some real I have had chefs who in the middle of a service said I'm not doing this yeah. Uh, yeah we've had chefs on the morning of the event saying that they want their flight tickets booked to yeah. back home with guests two hours away from coming in. Um, so clearly your role goes beyond curating experiences. That's the cost of effort. <laughs> we are therapists, <laughs> counsellors. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We've, we've had the uh, chefs like a couple of days before the event question why, you know, they, they don't have more media people coming for the table, right? That, okay, all the consumers are nice, but aren't there more journalists going to be there? And we're like, but people are paying money to come and eat, right? Like, doesn't that matter more? Uh, I think one of the funniest incidents was uh, with uh, Shriya uh, when we had, we had done a pop up at a, a hotel with her. Yeah, you can name her, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we don't care, Shriya. Uh, Shriya, we love you. I remember she walked in in the morning and uh, uh, she and she has this tendency of not talking about her troubles until the end of the day. So at the end of the day, we're sitting and uh, drinking, and the pop up was the next day, and we were like, everything fine. She's like, yeah, but they're mixer. <laughs> Their mixies are these really big ones, like industrial <laughs> type ones that are there in hotels. But I needed my, I forget the name of the Sujata. Time. Sujata. She's like, Sujata. I, Sujata. So we were like, what is this? So she's like, Sujata, the brand. Can they sponsor our events? Yeah. And then uh, the hotel team had to send someone from the kitchen team to go and buy Sujata, but they can't bring it into the kitchen because hotels don't allow you to just bring stuff in. So to, someone from the team had to come in as a normal customer into the hotel with the Sujata. And like uh, Shriya got a Sujata mixi. So if you're doing a pop up with uh, Shriya, get a Sujata. I think we're talking a lot about chefs. Let's talk about the bartenders. They are the more fun ones. Yeah. We were to fulfill some crazy requests for bartenders. That's all I'll say. Yeah. And uh, the most important thing, which involved the bar and the service, which involved like how <laughs> yeah. they wanted to enjoy their time in the country. That's what I meant. So does it involve the bar and the service in the event? No, no. That, that, that way we don't have too many issues with bartenders. They're like, it's very easy. Their prep is far easier than chef. You know what's the funniest one? And God, you would know. Visas. Oh, oh yeah. So most of the chefs and bartenders, 
since they come from economically, financially and politically stronger countries, they don't realize that India has a visa process. And different countries have different visa process. So we had a chef, Dre, you're hearing this. <laughs> he and his sous chef came down. He could come to uh, India. His sous chef couldn't because he didn't apply. He just applied for the visa. He didn't get the visa. So he went to the airport and he realized that there's no visa. So he had to send him back. Okay. We um, end the show usually on this game, which is two truths and a lie. Uh, with you guys, I will never know. Even offline, <laughs> I will never know when you're telling me the truth of lying to me. So this I know is going to be tough, but um, go for it. I have thrown up after and I had an allergic reaction after eating at one of Asia and world's best restaurant. I have introduced one of Asia's most prominent bar personality with a wrong name and a wrong um, uh, bar. And I have very confidently and I have walked out of my own pop-up. Okay, the lie is the last one. Wow, that's so easy. Yeah, you wouldn't because you didn't walk out of your own pop up. <laughs> Even if it was a complete shit show. I know. What are your truths? You know, what? My truths are very, you know. Okay, but which restaurant did you have in it? Uh, <laughs> I would never be able to say that. Uh, but yeah, I, it's my mistake. So I ate a. Your mistake? You were allergic to yourself. like. No, I, I was allergic to a couple of stuff which I just ate. So yeah, I threw up. The bar, you can say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Philip must be hearing this, but I introduced... Why do you assume all the chefs in bar that you, that you know are going to be listening? Philip Bishop as Philip Bishop from Tropic City. Well, he is from BKK Social. So I was in... Um, during the Asia Vitamus restaurant, he was there at a bar. And I was introducing him to Renji, who is the... who works at the Singapore Tourism Board. And I said, hey, listen, hey, you should meet Philip. And I met Philip like... Three times before that, we had this conversation, we speak. This is Philip from Tropic City. It's because at that time, we were getting Tropic City down for an event. And Philip, uh, the co-founders of uh, Tropic City, and it was in my head. And I said, Philip from Tropic City. And Philip being the gentleman that he is like, oh, I'm so sorry, but I am not from Tropic City. I am from BKK Social. And I, did, I really wanted to like dig deep and just go down and just vanish in eternity. And it was the worst God. thing I could have ever done. To myself. He's a godfather for all the four seasons. Yeah. Bars, like, <laughs> not just one. Really like, the, the worst thing. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Okay, can you top that? <laughs> okay, mine, none of them are FNB related. Is That's okay? fine. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, We're going to get to know you personally, so... <laughs> because I was uh, a witness to most of these, so... <laughs> um, so, I have been chased away at gunpoint from two borders. From two what? Borders. Oh, okay. Bordering India. Um, I have written my IAS exam. And uh, a screenplay idea I had pitched to somebody is going to become a film next year. <laughs> what? Why would have? <laughs> she really thought that's the lie? Oh, now she's oh confused. I'm actually confused. They're all ludicrous. No, the gunpoint thing must have happened because you go to all these shady places that to find share. Did you call our neighboring nation shady? shady? I'm going to go with uh, the second one. You I, know I, it's written your IS exam. It's a screenplay one. You went to the I. You. Actually, yeah, considering so, we all thought that it's true. Yeah, it might have had... true because you're the creative type. So, yeah. type possible. creative type. Because there's so much time while we're doing all of this to sit and write a screen. He's writing a screenplay about chefs yeah. and their <laughs> idiosyncrasies. That you that God he would sell <laughs> for a lot, <laughs> and you can. Uh... But uh, it was not in hunting hunting for chefs that I was chased away in that point. Okay. So, as a child with my dad who was in the army, who was playfully taking me across the China border where we got a warning, and. The Pakistan border, we didn't even get a word. I think your intelligence will call you. I think you're putting your dad into trouble. No, no. It's and why did time. you do the IAS exam? I mean, no offense to anyone who's done it, but uh, just out of curiosity, given you... There there was a time for very long where I wanted to join the foreign service. And there's always been like an inclination towards that. Then I realized my general intelligence levels. 
And I was applying for my pass the exam. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, we uh, love what you guys do, and um, we hope you do it for many, many more years. And even if you don't make any money doing it, we <laughs> all our money in eating and spending around. But I wish you all the best, and um, uh, you are allowed to come to Max Street as often as you like, even if you don't go. Thank you so much. Thank and you. It's always been such joy uh, helping with service and running behind chefs here. So to do this has been very different. The one thing we can do really well is if you're ever coming to Max Street Kitchen, we can guide you to the <laughs> Max Street Kitchen. Yeah. We can tell you where to take the left, where to take the right. Which corners to eat food in <laughs> without being spotted <laughs> by guests upstairs. <laughs> very well. Thank you.